Hi guys, James at Rampant Lion Reviews again for you today with another beer review. For this one, we are going to stick to Hong Kong and we're going to return to a brewery that's featured on the channel many times before. I've had some really nice beers from these guys over the last few years, quite a few different styles. And if people were to ask me about this brewery, I would say that they are just really solid all round. But the most interesting things that these guys have been doing in recent years are in the sour beer wild ale category. And the barrel program that these guys have is seriously, seriously interesting. Really quite pioneering, not just for Hong Kong, but for the wider Asian beer scene. And the sour beers they do really stand up very well in international circles, in my opinion, as well. But uh, yeah, the beer that we're going to have a look at today is a style that has a bit of a special place in my heart because it opened up a whole other world of craft beer to me and I've just been exploring that ever since actually. But the particular beer is one that I've tried from these guys before because I tried it at the launch party. I know it's very, very good and uh, I'm looking forward to doing a proper kind of sit down tasting and analysis of this one. So uh, yeah. Needless to say, very, very curious to try this beer again. Hopefully it's as good as I remember. Hopefully it makes for an interesting review. And as always, I hope that you guys watching enjoy my take on this one as well. So yeah, for this review then, we're going to head a little bit to the northwest of me here in Kowloon, up to Kwai Chung, uh, which happens to be the home of the wonderful Yardley Brothers Brewery, or Yardley Brothers Craft Brewery, or simply Yardley's, as many people call them. But this particular beer, is called In Flanders Fields. It comes in at 7.5% ABV. This one is a Flanders Red Ale, or I guess we have to say Flanders Style Red Ale because it's not from Vlaanderen in Belgium. But this one is aged for 33 months in Gamay Noir barrels from France. So uh, yeah, this beer, if I'm not mistaken, was released at the end of, or toward the end of 2023, and they also released a mulberry version of this as well, which um, I tried and quite enjoyed, but I have to admit, this one was my favourite out of the two, so this is the one that I decided to buy, but maybe in a future video we'll see about getting a bottle of the, uh, the mulberry one. But yeah, for the moment, the In Flanders Fields, Regular edition, 7.5% Flanders style radio from the wonderful Yardley Brothers Brewery here in, uh, in Hong Kong. So let's crack on with this one and see what this beer is going to have in store for us this time. But I will tell you, it is pretty damn good actually. So as always with my reviews, I'll tell you a little bit about the brewery before we taste the beer. If you want to get straight to the tasting though, just fast forward. All the usual links can be found in the video description below. That's the brewery website, the link to my other reviews that I've done from Yardley Brothers Brewery before, and we will no doubt review more from these guys again at some point in the fairly near future. But there's all the usual social media down there. If you want to see more reviews, do please consider subscribing to the channel. The support that you give is massively appreciated. And remember, you can go into the channel homepage and search for beer using the geography tagging system. So just go in there, use the little search bar, put in your hometown, state, county, province, whatever you like. If I've reviewed beers from the area that you search for, they will pop up. Failing that, you can check out the playlist of beers from different countries. You'll find this one in the Hong Kong playlist along with a number of other things. And you can check out the playlist of beers from other countries as well because there are some very, very interesting things on the channel these days. But yeah, good number of beers from Yardley Brothers in there as well. And that Hong Kong playlist is getting updated really quite regularly because there's a lot of good beer appearing here at the moment. But uh, yeah, let's go on to my brewery notes then and I'll tell you a wee bit about Yardley Brothers Brewery once again then. So the Yardley Brothers Brewery or Yardley Brothers Craft Brewery, Yardley's, whatever we're going to call them, was founded by Luke and Duncan Yardley, whom of course it takes their name from. But the brothers are half Scottish, half English, and Luke previously worked as a parts wholesaler and he ended up staying in Hong Kong after meeting a girl, but later on uh, he married a different girl. But he and Duncan had home brewed and then uh, back in uh, the UK and then they took it up again when Duncan joined Luke in Hong Kong back in about 2014. And the main reason for doing this was that they couldn't get the kinds of beer that they wanted to drink. So the first brewery they had was in a small shack on Lama Island, but then in December of 2016, they opened a production brewery on the fifth floor of an industrial building. And the reason they did that was because the rent was very, very cheap. And, uh, you know, for those of you who know anything about Hong Kong, the first thing you should know 
is that uh, the the rent here is absolutely mm. horrendous. But apparently, when uh, they moved the tanks, they wouldn't actually fit into the elevator. So eight people actually had to push these things up the stairs. And uh, thankfully, they stayed in this brewery for a number of years. And this was in the Kwai Chung area to the northwest of Kowloon at the Watat Industrial Estate. But uh, yeah, um, these days they have two bars. There's the Beer Shack out on Lama Island where the brewery originates. And they've also got their tap room on Peel Street in Central. And both are good venues to visit, although my personal favourite is the Beer Shack. But in the last few years, they've been working quite hard to develop their barrel programme, which they started back in 2018. And they also moved into a new and larger larger brewery still in the Kwai Chung area uh, toward the, the middle, I think it was, of 2023. But as of June 2024, when I'm filming this review for you, these guys have produced 150 different kinds of beer, a wide variety of different styles. You'll find lagers, IPAs, um, old English ales and stuff like this from these guys, and uh, a lot of uh, barrel beers these days as well. They're doing a hell of a lot of kind of wild ales and sour beers and stuff like this but one of the uh, really pioneering beers that they did as well back in the day was called the beast which was a freeze distilled ipa and that for a while at least i'm not sure if it still does held the title of the strongest beer produced in asia so um yeah as you can see yardley brothers have been a very very pioneering brewery over the years and they are one that you should definitely check out particularly if you like uh sour beers and wild ales and stuff like this but um, yeah, that's everything I can really tell you about uh, Yardley Brothers Brewery for the moment. If you want to learn more about these guys, you can check out the brewery website. You can follow them on Facebook and Instagram to keep up to date with all the latest goings on. And you can check out the Rate Beer, Untapped and Beer Advocate pages to learn a little bit more about all the different beers that these guys have done. So um, yeah, let's go on and we'll tell you a little bit about the beer itself. So. Just to let you have a wee look at the artwork on this one before we open up there, you can see this is quite a famous picture actually, um, if I'm not mistaken. I remember I studied the First World War quite a little bit uh, in school actually, and of course I did some history uh, as extra courses during my, my university days. So yeah, this picture of the battles in Flanders, the, the Dutch Flemish speaking region of Belgium is um, pretty famous actually. So um, yeah, this one, as we said, it's a 7.5% Flanders style red ale. This one is aged in Gamay Noir barrels, which come from uh, a little area uh, called Beaujolais uh, in the Burgundy region of France. The uh, malt base in this one, because we were able to find this one out, it's a bit unusual actually for Yardley Brothers that, but the malt base in this one is uh, Pilsner, Vienna, Cara Pils, Cara Hell, Cara Amber, and Special W malt. And this one uses Hallertau hops, and as I say, 33 month uh, Gamay Noir uh, barrel aged. So has a little poem on the side here as well, which is from uh, McCree, quite a famous uh, Scottish or Canadian, I forget, uh, World War One poet. But yeah, um, it says on the side here, in Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row, uh, that marker place and in the sky, the larks still bravely singing, fly scarce head amid the guns below. We are the dead short days ago, the dead short days ago. We lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from failing hands we throw uh, the torch. Be yours to hold it high, if ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep through poppies grow in Flanders fields. Yeah, all right. I don't know why I, I didn't realize uh, John McCree, but yeah, this is he must have been he was the Canadian surgeon, I believe, that uh, wrote that poem, of course, because he came out from operating on someone and just saw the red poppy fields. I remember that story, but um, yeah, the yeast used in this one it's uh, fermented with Saccharomyces and Brettanomyces with some Lactobacillus and Idiocus bacteria as well. For those of you who are uh, biology nerds, um, but yeah. That's that plain black bottle cap on this one, um, 750 milliliter bottle of course, and I believe I paid 200, maybe 250 Hong Kong dollars for this one, which translates to about 25 pounds sterling, somewhere in the region of like 27 euros, 50, 28 euros or 30 dollars American, something like that. So yeah, craft beer here in Hong Kong is pricey, but um, relative to wages, you know, it's... Uh, it's not something, you know, you don't um, expect good beer 
to be cheap. Let's just say that in Hong Kong. But yeah, let's get this guy out into the glass and see how we go. So that is just under half of the bottle, I believe, out and uh, into the glass just now. And yeah, you can see this beer looks absolutely beautiful. So before the head disappears, we can see that this one has poured with a lovely half finger of a frothy, I would say kind of fawn coloured head. You can see there are one or two medium bubbles sitting on the surface of the liquid there. But of course it gets a little bit more foamy the further up that, um, that you go with this one. But you can see colour wise this one is absolutely beautiful. It's got a lovely kind of red cherryish tint to it, but yeah, it's got a really nice um, kind of chestnutty stained mahogany type colour, this one. But yeah, one or two big bubbles sticking toward the side of the glass, a few little ones going up toward the bottom of the head there. But yeah, the colour of this one is absolutely lovely. It's got a little bit of natural haze to it, of course, as well. But remember, the colour of your beer depends on a few things. One, the type of malts that you use. This goes a long way to determining your EBC rating. Two, length of your wort boil is also going to play a role because the longer you boil the wort, the more the sugars caramelise and thus you get a darker colour of the beer. But any barrel ageing that you do or adjuncts you put into the beer will affect its colour as well. But uh, yeah, when it comes to kind of more brown beers like this, the barrel can play quite a role. So I do wonder if some of the reddish character coming out of this one is from the, uh, the Gamay Noir. Uh, barrel actually and you know potentially when it's been used for 33 months as this one has just under three years um, that probably will play quite a role actually but yeah um, in honesty I don't think we really need to say too much more about the appearance of this one it's pretty much within the parameters that you would expect of this style so I think we can move on and have a wee look at the aroma of the beer actually so um, yeah let's do that aroma section time really curious about this Oh yeah, it smells absolutely lovely, this one. Yeah, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, one of the things with Yardley's is they are fans of very, very long um, barrel aging and they always just seem to get it spot on. A lot of people call Luke um, a wizard when it comes to his beers because he just seems to pull it off so well. But the thing I really love about the, um, the Yardley brothers beers is just that they always have this kind of slightly leathery slightly oily smooth sweetness to them and um, you can smell it straight away when you look at this particular beer um, it's so so obvious actually but um, yeah this thing smells absolutely wonderful I have to say that and it gives you everything you'd expect of the style that's for sure Just beautiful, beautiful smelling beer. So, yeah. I could sit and smell this all day. So, this one. Um, where to start? The backbone of the beer is, of course, that lovely, smooth, but slightly dry European oak. That forms the backbone of the beer. Within the, the oak, you can, of course, smell a good little bit of vanilla. So that lovely little bit of vanilla that comes out of this one kind of lingers there on the aroma too but of course you've got big big vinous notes out of this one which you would expect with the beer being um yeah you would expect that with the beer being very um you know so long barrel aged actually so yeah you've got this lovely that the the wine note that you get out of this one comes across as being a little bit more acidic and just having a little bit more sort of sharpness to it and I have to admit, I really, really do like that about um, about this particular beer. Um, the Venice notes are just lovely in this one, actually. Um, but yeah, on top of that, you start to get the kind of malty side of the beer. So above that, you can smell like a little touch of um, like, I don't know if I really want to say like rye bread bread crust, but almost like a German kind of pumpernickel bread and you know it's German malts that have been used in this one. I'm not sure if the Belgian breweries use um, more Belgian or German malts to be honest with you but um, yeah the 
the character that comes out of this one, the Brady character certainly is just really, really German, if you like. So you've got that lovely kind of pumpernickel, brown Brady bread crust in there. Um, there is a little touch of an almost crackery note to this one, but then yeah, you've got lovely wholemeal brown bread in there. You've got a little bit of kind of white bready character coming out of this one as well, which I think is great. And then um, on top of that, you start to get the brown sugars. So for me, there's a little touch of, um, there is a wee touch of like a slightly toasty brown sugar in there, but it's very smooth and very, very kind of leathery. If you like, and usually when you get leathery brown sugars in a beer like this, it's a sign of, um, you know, it's a sign of longer wort bottle, but I don't think that's often the case when it comes to um, to Flanders radios. I don't think there's really any value to doing a, a longer wort bottle in these, and stouts and barley wines and stuff, it gives you more complex flavours and things like that, but in the case of this beer, I don't see the value to, to doing that. I think a lot of the leatheriness and things is actually coming from the, the tannins and stuff from the barrel. But yeah, you do have some lovely brown sugary notes to this one. As I say, you've got that more leathery brown sugar in there. There's a bit of straight up sweet caramel. You've got that Werther's original butter candy, butterscotchy sort of thing coming out of it. And then yeah, you've got some really nice kind of McVitie's digestive biscuity notes coming out of this one. So um, yeah. The way that that goes together, I think, is um, is really, really very nice. Um, the only other thing I would add is that there's maybe a little hint of nuttiness to this one, you know, like a little bit of pecan or almond or something like that. I'm not the biggest nut fan, of course, so picking out these different nutty characters is not my particular forte. But, um, yeah, this beer really gives you everything that you would expect from this style and the malty side of things. And, of course, the sour character that comes out of this one is quite pungent actually but that's the thing you tend to find with the Yardley Brothers beers they're very pungent in their aroma and also their impact but the way they mellow out is beautiful and for me that's one of the signs of a great great sour beer actually so yeah um, on the um, hoppy side of things with this beer then um, it does have a bit of green component to it this one even though it's been barrel aged for, uh, for so long but the thing with um, these kind of sour beers is it's always interesting to talk about the hopping mentality so um, with older sour beer styles like this what they tended to do was use older hops that had lost a little bit of their alpha acid potency because the idea was you didn't want the hoppy bitterness to take away from the sour side of the beer um, with more modern sour beers where there's a lot of fruity adjuncts and things like that in them, there is a debate about whether you add uh, hops to the beer at all because the fruits will suppress that, but uh, at the same time adding the hops would add a bit more complexity to the beer, so this is something to think about here. But I do still think this beer has a little bit of that green component to it, which is quite interesting. So for me, in the aroma, there's a good little bit of... Um, yeah... There's a good little bit of kind of earthiness in there. So yeah, lovely little bit of earthiness at the back. Wee bit of herbal character as well. But I do still think this beer has quite a bit of floral presence to it. And also some nice grassiness in there. And it does have a wee bit of zestiness to it. One of the things I would have always said about the German hops, and we know there's Hallertau in this, the earthy herbal characters are very, very smooth. And so is the grassy and floral component. So um yeah, the way that all of that goes together, I think, is uh, is really very, very nice. Um, yeah, I do like that little bit of green component there. But on the fruity side of things, of course, that's one of the big things when it comes to uh, these Flanders radios. So, yeah, there's quite a little bit of cherry in this one, I would say. You've got that really kind of sharp cherry note in there, which you're always going to get in this style. But underneath that, there are... You know, elements of raisin, a little bit of fig and things like that as well. Some black currants too for me. So yeah, black currants, plums. I get a little bit of date almost in this one as well. So you've got that sharp cherry note, which is your impact on the nose. Good little bit of juicy plum, quite a lot of fig date in there as well. And um, yeah, a little bit of black currant and things as well so um yeah the way all of the the way that this beer the way everything goes together in this one i think is really 
really very nice. So um, yeah, really interesting stuff. As I always say, take a wee bit of time to just enjoy the aroma of the beer before you get stuck into it. But this is pretty damn good, I have to say. So yeah, I think it's about time that we taste this one and see what it's all about. So this is the In Flanders Fields, 7.5% Flanders Red Ale from the wonderful Yardley Brothers Craft Brewery in uh, Kwai Chung, in the, I think the new territories here in Hong Kong. Let's get stuck into this one. Slanja, Skull, cheers. forgot how good this one was. Um, i tell you something though, it does have a pretty damn powerful punch on the impact, so be prepared for that if you try this one. It really is pretty punchy for sure. Yeah, um, this is um pretty damn special actually um yeah it gets it's a little bit sharper than i remember it being i think i've had this bottle about i must have had it about six months at least it must be something like that but um yeah i do wonder if it's got a little bit sharper with the the aging and things like that but usually that's not the way it goes usually it leans it falls back and leans a little bit more towards the kind of woody tanniny side of things um but yes yeah, still uh, as good potentially better than i remember it being actually um but yeah as i say the impact you get from this one boom and then it just the way it mellows out and gives you that lovely um typical leathery slickness and smoothness that you expect to yardley's is just spot on so where do we start with this? Um, middle third of your palate then. The backbone of the beer is of course that lovely, smooth, European oak. And as I've said on the channel many a time before, American oak for me is considerably smoother than European oak. European oak is that little bit drier and almost has just a very, very slight spice to it. But yeah, that lovely European oak sits um, on the backbone of the beer. As you go further forward on that middle third of your palate, you can feel the little bit of vanilla in there. And then, yeah, you have the, um, the slightly drier, and almost slightly spicy side of the oak at the back of that middle third of your palate. So, yeah. So, yeah, the... On top of that um, nice woody layer, you do of course have that um, you have that lovely kind of vinous layer out of this one, and the the vinous layer is interesting because it really is quite acidic. So I think some of the sharpness you're getting out of the beer, quite a bit of it actually, is from that particular vinous layer. It's not surprising, of course, it's something you commonly find with. Um, red wine barrel aged sour beers um so yeah but the thing that you'll find with it is that acidity just gradually fades away and then you get more of the smoothness of the wood and then this lovely kind of leathery character like on the woody side of things you do get this almost like werther's original butter candy butterscotch sort of thing forming there so that's the way the beer develops and shows you it's more kind of tannin or sort of funky side almost so yeah i really do like how that pieces together as well um, yeah, on top of that vinous layer though, you start to get the actual malty side of the beer. So let's look at that. So yeah, the backbone of this beer on the malty side of things, you've got this slightly toasty, um, yeah, you've got this like slightly toasty kind of German pumpernickel bready character there and that does become a wee bit more prominent the further into the aftertaste that you go above that 
you've got a slightly taller and more fluffy and eerie wholemeal brown bread. Within that, within that, you've got a little bit of like a slight nutty character coming out as I say pecan almond, something like that. There's just a little bit of that coming out in um, in this beer, and then above that you get a smoother white bready type character coming out of that. Um, but the white bready character I think isn't too big a layer, it's more about the brown bread in this beer as you would expect. But yeah, um, above that you have more of a, yeah above that you've got more of a, the brown sugary character coming out. So you can feel the base layer of that, there's a very slightly toasty brown sugary character in there. Yeah. So, kind of toasty brown sugary character, as I say. Above that, you start to get a more leathery brown sugar out of the beer. So, yeah, the kind of leathery brown sugary character that comes out of this one lingers there into the aftertaste, which I think is very, very nice. And then above that, or beyond that, you get more of a above that you know you start to get in the dead center of your palate you can feel there's a straight up caramel there but then as you move further out from that you start to get this more Werther's original butter candy butterscotchy sort of thing and as I say that sits on top of the leathery brown sugar and then the toasty layer underneath that and that's above everything else that we've just described so yeah I think that's us covered the middle third of the palette in this beer, which is obviously the most complex part of it. So we're quite happy with that. Um, let's go to the back third of the palette then. As I have said, generally, um, sweeter flavours come out further forward on your palette, more dry and bitter flavours come out further back. And generally, the back third of your palette will give you very similar flavours to the middle third of your palette, just at different intensities. So, um, yeah. The border region between middle and back third of your palate, you get a nice little bit of a kind of brown bready character in there. And you can feel that builds up. There's a little bit of white bread above that, maybe just a slight touch of toasty brown sugar. But yeah, the base of that um, back third of your palate, you can feel the nice, the drier side of the oaky wood in there. So yeah, a nice dry oaky woody character in there. Um, you can feel the vinous layer in there as well, which feels a little bit more almost earthy actually, but certainly a little bit drier. Then you've got the toasty kind of pumpernickel bread crust in there. And then you've got that tall kind of wholemeal pumpernickel -y, brown bready character sitting above that. Feels a little bit lighter and more airy, but also a little bit drier. But then, yeah, you've got the kind of brown, the, the white bready side of this one um, sitting on top of that as well, which was a little bit lighter, and more airy. Then the more toasty brown sugary character uh, coming out of it as well. So, um, yeah, you can feel that toasty brown sugar just creeping over the top of the, over the back there. But then, yeah, some of the yeasty character sits above that on that back third of the palate as well. So let's have a wee look at that yeasty side of things. Yeah, you can feel this beer really... Obviously, it's airing out at the moment and it's kind of warming up and things like that. You can probably see the bottle sweating on the camera of course but yeah the warmer this beer gets the smoother the malty side and everything like that um the smoother the malty side of it gets but yeah on the um yeasty side of things with this one you can feel in the dead center you've got a more dense um kind of wholemeal sweet wholemeal brown bread in there and as you move further out from that it just gets a little bit more grainy and kind of farmhousey almost and then you've got a wee bit of a more kind of bread crusty character coming out of this one as well um, just around the edge so yeah you can really get that coming out of this one so yeah the yeasty character I'd say yeah wholemeal brown bread a little bit more of a kind of farmhousey brown bread around the side um, and then almost a little bit of cracker or kind of brown bready bread crust just uh, lingering around the edge there but definitely 
the back third of your palate you can feel the flavor is taller and then as you move further forward into the middle third of your palate it just kind of condenses down a bit and uh, squashes together but yeah um on to the uh hoppy side of the beer then let's have a little look at that so obviously with this beer being three years barrel aged a lot of the hoppy character will have dropped out but there are still little remnants of it there so yeah um in the back corners of the palate you can certainly feel a good little bit of that smooth earthiness as you move further forward it does have a little bit of a more herbal character and then as you push further forward along the sides of the tongue it's got a wee bit more of a uh, I would say it's got a little bit more of that kind of floral, aromatic um, sort of thing coming out of it as well. So you get that nice kind of floral aromaticity and then round the front curve of the tongue you can feel a little bit of a more zesty, grassy sort of character but very distinctly German of course. Um, but yeah, still quite smooth as I say. The whole vibe of this particular beer is like a really big leathery smoothness almost. into the aftertaste I'll show you the impact is of course the big cherries um, the sourness then the smoothness of them all and then yeah you got all that lovely silky tanniny smoothness coming out of the beer into the aftertaste um, but yeah let's focus on the front third of your palate then and the sour side and fruity side just to round off the tasting so yeah border region between front third and middle third of your palate you get that nice little bit of kind of bready build up in there you can feel the kind of brown bread in the base, the little bit of white bread in the top, and the wee bit of toasty, kind of toasty brown sugar at the top. But yeah, the base of that front third of your palate is more of a, um, yeah, it's more of a kind of smooth. Yeah, there's a good little bit of a kind of smooth, oaky note in there. As I say, you get that smooth oak in the base. There's quite a bit more vanilla to it as well. You get the vinous layer the uh, bread crust, the brown bread, and then the white bread and the smooth, um, yeah, the smooth sort of, uh, yeah, kind of leathery and more those original type flavours. And then, of course, above that, you've got the sour side coming in and the big kind of um, fruity notes coming out of it as well. So, yeah, it's really, really good stuff in that sense. So yeah, I like that about this for sure. Let's look at that sour side of things then. So yeah, the sour side of this beer is of course, the impact flavour is really very sharp. Like a very, very sharp, um, it reminds me of the Stensbeer cherries from Denmark actually. It really comes across like that. But yeah, the um, you can feel the impact. It's kind of at the back of the front third of your palate and at the very kind of, front tip of your tongue so you've almost got like a double pronged attack in there so it comes in and then it just mellows out you've got that big big sharp cherry in the beginning and that lingers there into the aftertaste i'm still getting it you've seen how long it was since i took a sip of this beer but it just sits there and it mellows out and then you start to get a few other flavors out of the beer as well so at the back of that um front third of your palate there's like a sort of dainty character in the base there's a bit of plum uh, yeah, plum on the top, dates underneath, a little bit of a more kind of sultana type flavour uh, coming out of it as well. Um, and then, yeah, as you move further forward from that, you get a little bit more of a slightly figgy character and then a wee bit of like black current into the front half of that front third of your palate. So the fruity character in this one's really quite interesting, actually. I have to say that, but the sharpness of this, I forgot, this beer, it's a little bit sharper, I think. Um, with the age, with the fact that it's been in the bottle a little bit more than I remember it being out of the bottles that we tried um, in the, the tap room. I can't remember, I think we tried both the Mulberry and the... Um, we did try both the Mulberry and uh, this one, and I think this one was on tap, whereas the Mulberry was straight out of the bottle, so maybe that's the reason, maybe the bottle version is a little bit sharper than it was on tap actually. Um, honestly can't remember but still very very good this one but quite an impact let's round off this review then with just a wee look at the mouthfeel we said everything we need to about the flavour I think so yeah for me mouthfeel wise this beer um, I'd say generally 
it's kind of pushing top end and mid body but within the kind of wild beer sour beer um category i think this one's at the heavier end of the spectrum the carbonation does have a little touch of prickle to this one but this beer it does come across as being quite clean and it also has a good degree of smoothness to it just that kind of leathery dryness and a bit of smoothness i would say as well but um yeah the the malty side of this beer as i see you've got that lovely smooth oaky character underneath a little bit of the vinous character in there the malty side of it's very smooth as i say as well and then you get that dry sweetness on top ibu wise i think there's only got to be about you know 10 or 15 ibus to this beer you do get a little bit of lingering bitterness into the aftertaste but then yeah the fruity side of things in this one as i say you've got that big 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 sharp sour impact to this one and that does linger there into the aftertaste a lot that's probably due to the length of the, the barrel aging with this one. And then, yeah, you've got these lovely softer fruity characters that come out of it later. The plums, the sultanas, the yeah, the dates and uh, stuff like this. So, yeah, the way that all of this kind of pieces together, I think, is really nice. Beautiful, beautiful beer, this one. And uh, this kind of shows you how good the, the barrel aged stuff that's coming out of Yardley's actually is. So, um, yeah, I think we can leave it at that for this one so um yeah i think this has been awesome so yeah this is the uh, in flanders fields regular edition 7.5 percent 33 month uh, gamay noir barley's flanders style radio from the wonderful yardley brothers brewery in kwai chung uh in here in hong kong so yeah thank you again for watching my beer reviews until the next time please like subscribe share all the usual youtube stuff let me know your own thoughts on this beer in the comment section below let me know what your favorite beers are from yardley brothers brewery as well and we will no doubt return to these guys again in the very near future but in the meantime check out my social media check out their social media and i'll see you guys later ciao just now